hi and welcome to the Bruce channel come on in away last week and lots of stuff going on so we're going to be busy I'll try to go fast so no not the most important but the most obvious the AP has been ranking the top 25 college football teams since 1950 sometimes the rankings have stayed pretty steady through the season sometimes they've been more of a bubbling cauldron the way they rank them is simple 65 sports writers broadcasters are polled every week and each of them ranks 1 through 25 their 25 best teams the 65 ballots are then aggregated if you are a number one team you get 25 points two gets 24 and so on and they do that with all 20 all 65 ballots never before Never, ever, ever, never, never, <laughs> never. The poll obviously comes out weekly, but the first one comes out before the first game. And never has the top-ranked team been unanimously everyone's number one until this year. So, and I can't decide whether I like that. Or whether I should worry. All right, and of course the NFL is officially back in session. Tom Brady did win his appeal in federal court of his four-game suspension for deflate gate, and the NFL will now appeal that result. But until that is decided, he can't play, and he did Thursday night, and they beat Pittsburgh. It's unlikely we will ever really know what happened, or at least fully understand, but I know this. Someone in the Patriots organization and some of their fans said something that that's never made sense to me, that the NFL was looking to take down Brady, and I don't understand that because, you know, he's good looking, he's a very good quarterback, he works hard, he's never been suspended for banned substances or physical assaults on women. He's been exactly what they would like to promote, so why would they wish to take him down? Anyway. Besides, as everybody knows, you've got to be a football hero to get along with the beautiful girls. Everyone that I know in school is now back in school. I saw several cartoons around Labor Day featuring back-to-school themes, and that may be because cartoonists aren't kids, and maybe they're old enough so that their kids aren't in school. I don't know, but honestly, I don't know of any School, dris, school districts that wait for Labor Day anymore. Now, I bet that since there are a lot of school, dris, school districts, why is that hard to say? Some were, some wait for Labor Day, but I only mention this because this year, from the standpoint of my childhood, would have been a jackpot year. The worst is when September 1st is Monday, Labor Day, which means you go to school the day after on the 2nd. The best is if September 1st is on Tuesday. Labor then waits till the 7th. You go to school on the 8th. That's like an extra week of freedom. And I know that's illusory. That's, that's an illusion because the number of school days stays the same, but it was a fun illusion. So if you are in school and if you started the day after Labor Day, hallelujah, this was a jackpot year. What else happened? J.K. Rowling, author of Harry Potter, told us this week that we've been pronouncing Lord Voldemort incorrectly, that it should be with a silent T, Lord Voldemort, French silent T. She said that she thought she was the only one in the world to pronounce it that, that way. She acknowledged that. And then somebody posted a video clip of her from years ago saying it with a T and like, what's that about? Oh yeah, take that, J.K. Rowling. What do you want? What are they, envious? Although it might help explain why he must not be named. Okay, so the presidential election cycle continues. And I never fail to be entertained by the process, sometimes mortified. And I've watched the process several times, and I have studied others, and I'm struck by the changes. Because, well, for one thing, in the beginning there were... <laughs> That's a really good phrase. I should write that down. In the beginning. Anyway, in the beginning, there weren't any political parties. 
George Washington in particular hoped they would never form. But inevitably, differences of opinion led to different factions, and factions led to parties. So early on, members of Congress would vote and nominate their party's presidential candidates. And later, you know, it moved to the back rooms, the smoke-filled back rooms, party bosses. And primaries almost became important. They might have if things worked out differently. But in 1912, William Howard Taft was president. He was challenged by former president Theodore Roosevelt. Teddy and Taft had been friends, but Teddy was very disappointed by the things Taft was doing in office, so he challenged him. And even though Teddy got more votes through the primaries, there were only about a dozen or so states with primaries, and at that they weren't, they weren't binding. They were non-binding, so the delegates went ahead and they nominated Taft. Decades later, John Kennedy used the primaries to prove his electability, and that was in doubt because he was a Catholic. No Catholic had ever been elected. Interesting, too, you know, that wasn't that long ago, but he announced he was running for president on January 2nd of 1960, the election year itself. <laughs> what was it, last December? Which would have been 23 months before the election? Last December is when Jeb Bush announced he was officially forming a committee to explore the possibility of his running, something like that. Two years. So, you know, here we are still well over a year before the election, and everybody's in it. I find this leftover fact interesting, too. Dr. Ben Carson is a world-renowned neurosurgeon. Carly Fiorina has been the CEO of a large corporation. Donald Trump is owned, build, look up on the sky, able to leap, leap over tall buildings. And he's owned airlines and casinos and sports teams. But in 1960, John Kennedy, a Democrat, was said by the Republicans to be too inexperienced to be president. He'd been in the House for eight years. He'd been in the Senate another eight years. My, my, how things have changed. So, yeah, you know, they change long term. They, they change over the short term, too. This is an article from the March 16th issue of Time magazine. And it opens, Jeb Bush is running for the White House exactly 55 minutes at a time. That's how long it takes him to march through quickie fundraisers that can rake in $150,000 an hour. He rolls into a friendly law firm or lobbying shop with a lone aide, holds forth for 15, 20 minutes, takes questions for 10 more, snaps a few photos, then ducks out back into a car that whisks him to a new batch of benefactors. Since jumping into the race in mid-December, Bush has often netted a million bucks a day and sometimes more. It goes on to say, Already this gusher of cash has chased Mitt Romney from the field, crushed Chris Christie's momentum, and sent a message to Hillary Clinton. Wow. For a long time, we kept hearing of Hillary's inevitable nomination for the Democrats, and in polls, she invariably beat whichever Republican the polls matched her against. And Jeb Bush, with his connections and fundraising capability, was thought to be the most likely to be nominated. In this March issue, nowhere in the article is Donald Trump mentioned, Bernie Sanders isn't mentioned, Dr. Ben Carson is not mentioned. Here we are, still over a year from the election, but it's months since March. Trump continues to lead the Republicans. In second place, Dr. Carson. <laughs> and on the other side, Senator Sanders is said to have narrowed the gap in Iowa and taken the lead in New Hampshire. I'm not a professional psychic. I've never even played one on TV. I'm not smart enough to say with certainty what will happen 14 months from now. Tells bells, I'm not smart enough to tell you with certainty what will happen tomorrow. Still, I'm very confident this. I could be wrong, but if given the opportunity, I would bet the farm that Donald Trump will not be the Republican nominee. I say that because I believe he could never be elected president in my lifetime. No Democrats would vote for him, and I suspect few independents would. And Republicans can do that math, meaning that if they nominated him, they'd lose, and they know they'd lose. 
I don't think I could live long enough to see a candidate who calls a female national television anchor, Megyn Kelly, a bimbo, calls an opponent, Jeb Bush, low energy, then says that Dr. Carson makes Jeb Bush look like the Energizer Bunny, says of uh, Carly Fiorona, look at that face! <laughs> Would anyone vote for that? Can you imagine that, the face of the next president? I mean, she's a woman, I'm not supposed to say bad things, but really, folks, come on, are we serious? I don't think I will live long enough to see anyone who speaks like that elected president. It's not to say it will never happen. If we continue on our present trajectory, as we become less empathic and more inured to tragedy, we become less aware of others' pain, and worse, caring less if we even do become aware of it, so long as we become ever more coarse in language and in manners, and as we find ever greater self-fulfillment through schadenfreude, so long as we continue to devolve, then yes, I'd not bet against a Donald Trump election ever. I'd bet on it. But we're not yet there. Or so I hope. You know, in any other presidential race I've ever observed or studied, any one of these Trumpisms ends your campaign. Look what happened to Rick Perry, governor of Texas, four years ago. And, you know, for him, whether you're for him or against him, this was awful to watch. Uh, what's the third one there? Let's see. <laughs> you need five. Oh, five. Yeah, okay. So, five. commerce, education, and uh, the... Um, um, uh, EPA? EPA. There you go. No, I can't. <laughs> Is EPA the one you were talking about? Or? No, sir. No, sir. We were talking about the um, agencies of government. EPA needs to be rebuilt. But There's you no can't, doubt about but that. But you can't name the third one? The third agency of government, yeah. I, would, I would do away with the education, uh, the uh, <laughs> commerce, I, I, commerce, and let's see. Oh I can't. The third. Sorry. <laughs> Oops. One lapse. It seemed to last forever. Really only a few seconds several seconds. He was viewed as the front runner before he even declared, but that oops was the beginning of the end. That could happen to anybody. Shoot, I've sung the national anthem a number of times at once. I had a one second lights out, forgot part of the lyrics. I covered it with nonsense syllables, but it was out there. Oops. Mine was only in a stadium, not on national TV. By the way, Governor Perry just announced he was leaving this year's race. Apparently he had worked much harder this time to be prepared. I've heard and read that in any number of places that no one is prepared for just how grueling campaigning for president is and the first time you do it is rarely successful. So I'm sure he thought this time he knew what to expect but <laughs> how could anyone expect a Donald Trump? Once Trump entered he took lots of attention away from the others. He self-funds Jeb Bush, as mentioned, as the master at getting the money. Governor Perry ran out of money before he could get anything going. I did find it amusing. His op ex-opponents now had these beautiful words of praise. Louisiana Governor Bobby Jindal said, Governor Perry is a great friend and has the best record of any governor anywhere, anytime. Which is a little over the top. Uh, for that to have any meaning, one would have to believe that Governor Jindal knows the history and record of every governor of every state. Jeb Bush, amen, God bless Rick Perry for his continuing commitment to that cause. And Donald Trump, Governor Perry is a terrific guy and I wish him well. I know we will have a great future if Rick Perry hadn't run out of money if he had managed to find some traction and get somewhere in the polls, well, I think Messrs. Jindal and Bush and Trump would have found fewer of his qualities to praise. Trump especially picks on those who are doing the best, right? Now that Dr. Carson is doing better, that's when he started to pick on Dr. Carson. Anyway, if Rick Perry, this great guy, had won the presidency, then what would Mr. Trump have said? Because, you know, always our leaders are stupid. Anyway. 
I believe the reason, I've said this before, that Donald Trump and Senator Bernie Sanders and Dr. Carson have energized so many new followers among people who had never heard of them is these three candidates, more so than nearly any of the others, listen to a question and then answer it without changing or deflecting the question. Not to beat it to death, Trump's answers are often over the top, but he does not equivocate which is what politicians are taught to do. They are schooled, they are handled, they are drilled over and no, no, governor. When they ask you why you're in favor of, pick something, anything, deficit, immigration, Iran, the color of your office, doesn't matter, don't answer it. Instead say, I think we're missing the point by that and we should instead, and then you string together some nice words and then you adopt the posture positive posture and you confidently project, you answered the question, even though you hadn't. Ooh, I love to dance, little sidestep. Now they see me, now they don't have come and gone. Ooh, I love to sweep around the wide step, but a little swap and lead up. I heard Jim Lehrer interviewed about that once. He was asked about the frustration involved. Ask a question and get no real answer. He said something like, well, you know, a good journalist will try again. Sometimes you rephrase and even simplify it, but he says, uh, you can see sometimes they are not going to answer the question, so you move on. I said Trump's answers were sometimes over the top. I didn't just mean the insults. Over the top includes things like, just trust me, we're going to start winning. We're going to start winning so much, you're going to get tired of winning. Trust me, you're going to love it. I could add, too, that Carly Fiorina also provided non-politician answers to her questions in the first debate. People responded well to her, and I think that's why she's now moved into the upper tier debate on CNN this week. Both tiers are Wednesday, the first one at 6 and the second one at 8, that's Eastern Time. Well, as I said, the energy on the Democratic side seems to be with Senator Bernie Sanders of Vermont. He speaks plainly, he speaks a consistent message, and despite his age, he's 74, he seems fresh, full of energy. Hillary's younger, she turns 68 next month, but I, I don't know. Maybe when you've been on the stage for 20 years, no matter what you do or say, it's hard to look fresh. And when she answers, she does sound practiced and drilled. I, I think she does not wish to make a mistake like she did eight years ago. She spoke of landing in a country somewhere and getting off the plane and putting her head down with guns and tape later showed that was hyperbole. No real harm, maybe just a mistaken memory. I mean, that can happen to everyone, just like Governor Perry had a memory blip. She certainly traveled more than I ever will. Uh, I don't doubt she may have had more touchdowns on more runways than maybe any other woman ever. But that mistake eight, eight years ago started a descent. And, you know, she didn't recover from it. It was close. It went until June, but she did not get the nomination. I think maybe she doesn't want to risk that kind of a thing again, but it, you know, it doesn't, doesn't cause excitement. And then the, free, the shrinkage of the... Hillary is inevitable feeling has now caused discussion that Joe Biden may get in, and he might. I said some shows ago, my guess is he would not run. He's about a year younger than Bernie. Either one of them would be the oldest ever elected. But he talked about it earlier this week, and what you've got to remember is what he's been through. If you don't know, he was elected to the Senate at age 29, although yes, by turning 30 later in November, he was constitutionally then eligible to hold the office of senator. He and his wife, Neela, had three kids, two sons and a daughter. A few weeks after his 30th birthday, on December 18th, his wife, they're out Christmas shopping, pulls into the path of a truck. She and their daughter were killed, the two boys badly injured. The older boy, Bo, who had served in Iraq and was Attorney General for Delaware, I think he was 44, just died 
of brain cancer in May, I think. So, yeah, you know, if that's your son dies before you, it might just motivate him to step away and say, I've done enough. He might say, no, I'm going to do this for Bo, but he might also say, I'm spending the rest of my time, as much of it as I can, with my family, because you don't know when it don't happen. Anyway, I think it speaks well of us as a nation that, politics and viewpoint aside, we could elect a black man. I think it would speak equally well of us if one day we elect a woman. And I know other countries have had successful leaders, women as successful leaders, in Indira Gandhi, Golda Meir, Margaret Thatcher. Right now, arguably, the most influential leader in all of Europe is Germany's Angela Merkel. <laughs> It could also be reasonably argued that <laughs> take any time in history, look what was done, and look how it turned out, and how what, you, know, you could be talking 300 years ago, but see, take a look, examine what was done, and how that affects us today. <laughs> I think you could make a reasonable argument that certainly sometimes cojones aren't necessarily the best motivators for rational behavior. Speaking of Joe Biden, reminded me, when he was first elected in 1972, it was a ridiculous upset. That was the year of Richard Lincoln. Richard Lincoln. <laughs> Wouldn't that be so? Richard Nixon's landslide election against George McGovern. The Democrats almost couldn't get someone to run for the Senate in Delaware that year against the Republican incumbent. That reminds me of another upset. There's a segue here. Four years later, a guy completely unknown outside of his home state came out of nowhere to capture both the Democratic nomination and then the presidency. I'm speaking, of course, of James Earl Carter, the man from Plains, Georgia, known as Jimmy Carter. He's 90 years old now. He announced in August he had surgery for liver cancer. And later in August, he announced that apparently a stage four, had, he's got some cancer in his brain and he's going to undergo drug and radiation therapy. He said it calmly and he answered questions with grace and with humor. He is certainly one of the smartest presidents we've ever had. I mean, the guy studied nuclear physics he was not the most successful president we've ever had. The reports are that he was a micromanager, and he may have been. And he was also hit by things completely outside his control. Oil was spiraling. We had gas shortages. And everything that's made from petroleum also went up in price then, so we had big-time inflation. But he did have some triumphs. In the Camp David Accords of 1978, he brought together two arch enemies Egypt's President Anwar el-Sadat and Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin. Since then, the two countries always haven't been the best of buddies, but they have not fought a war since then either. They've been having many since the founding of Israel, so it was significant. And Sadat and Begin shared the Nobel Peace Prize. So I was not a particularly large fan of Jimmy Carter while he was in office, but I'll say this. I think he's the best ex-president we've ever had. He's written books. He's gone to oversee contentious elections. He's tried to find peaceful solutions to conflicts worldwide, and he has trusted. He's been a good broker. He's been a gentleman and a great role model. And I believe he's offered many wise observations since he left office, and one of my favorites is. We will not learn how to live together in peace by killing each other's children. Fare thee well, Mr. President. Fare thee well. Now, I don't know if they ever met. I don't know if President Carter ever read anything he wrote, but at the end of August, the earth turned yet again a bit rougher, a bit coarser, and another kind soul left. I speak of Dr. Wayne Dyer. I've read several of his books and learned many things from them. One of my, one of my favorite quotes of his in a relationship where two people agree on everything, one of them is redundant. On our last show, I spoke of value of kindness. 
I wasn't suggesting we all become Mother Teresa or Albert Schweitzer, humanitarians of that sort, or, but that's fewer than one in a billion. My goal would be more modest. Not that we become saints, but I'd bet that both Jimmy Carter and Wayne Dyer have been angry in their lives. I'd bet that they both used every curse word known. They were both in the Navy. No. My hope would be that we could better avoid jealousy, that we more often wish success for others, and maybe once in a while offer a helping hand. I don't know if Jimmy Carter watches the Bruce Channel. He's never written me. Unless he's used the nom de plume. <laughs> Same for Wayne Dyer. But I am sure they'd approve of my saying to you today on Rosh Hashanah, La Shana Toba, for a good year. I do hope your upcoming year is the best one you've ever had. Namaste.